All right. We're going to just uh, keep right on rolling here into our uh, next presentation. And I'm going to try and say these letters correctly because every time I say this, it tends to come out in a different order of these particular <laughs> letters. Uh, DMAC, the DMA Memory and System Controller by Michael Morrison. Hello, I hope everyone has enjoyed their first day at Kansas Fest. I'm excited to tell you about a project that I've been working on for some time called the DMAC. The DMAC board is very much a work in progress. It's mostly incomplete. Uh, it's a personal project that I work on as I have time. I guess we all wish that our personal projects would advance quicker than they do. Uh, so what does DMAC mean? DMAC stands for Direct Memory Access Controller. Uh, this is not very original. Most systems that have a DMA controller uh, call it a DMAC, but I kind of like the name, so it stuck. Uh, as far as goals for the project, um, the primary goal for me, actually, is to relearn electronics and to learn uh, modern FPGA programming as well as Verilog. And having grown up with uh, an Apple and then an Amiga, uh, I thought a great way to do that would be to design a card that gave the Apple some of the great capabilities uh, of the custom chips in the Amiga. So I didn't want to create a board that replaced all the functionality inside the Apple. I wanted to create a board that would augment the functionality inside of the Apple. So use the video modes that WAS gave us, use the text modes that WAS gave us, the peripheral interfaces, etc. Not replace them like some of these other boards did, the mocking board and whatnot. These are nice boards, uh, but my goal was to augment functionality rather than replace. Uh, the project itself will be open source. Uh, as soon as it's farther along, I will create a GitHub page and I will upload all the schematics and source code uh, and all the project files there um, so that they're available for everyone. A non-goal uh, at this time uh, is productization. So uh, this project is not very complete at this point. So I've left that as a discussion for later. So the part I chose uh, for this project uh, was the PSOC from Cypress Semiconductor. Uh, it comes on this cool uh, prototyping kit that you can see here on the right. Um, the top of it actually is a programmer uh, and debugger. So you can plug that into your PC. Uh, you can modify your design. You can modify your code. Uh, you can upload it uh, in seconds, hit the reset button on the Apple, uh, and try it again. Um, it's got a lot of cool features, 80 megahertz processor, 64K of RAM. Uh, like I say, lots of I.O. We need uh, lots of I.O. for the uh, peripheral slot on the Apple. Um, it also has a very cool uh, FPGA-like uh, programmable front end uh, that allows you to uh, lay out circuits uh, as well as design uh, in Verilog, uh, which again uh, was one of my goals. Uh, it's an inexpensive part when you can find it, um, only $10 uh, on Cypress website. This is how I've mapped the pins on the prototyping board to the pins on the Apple II slot. Uh, one major thing to note here uh, before you try to duplicate this design is that there are several pins that are meant for analog input and output on this prototyping kit and they all contain capacitors uh, to ground. So you need to remove those capacitors in order to be able to use those pins as general purpose I.O. This is a screenshot from uh, PSOC Creator. Uh, it's the development tool that comes with the uh, Cypress development kit. Um, I assure you by the way that I am not a shill uh, for Cyprus, uh, but I've become enamored with this development kit uh, and this part because it's fairly easy to use. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this is meant to show uh, how easy it is to create something uh, that allows you to interface to your Apple uh, and to the uh, ARM CPU on the PSOC. Uh, so this simple circuit uh, would give you a three register uh, input, uh, one register output configuration. Uh, that would allow you to talk from Apple to PSOC um, and you could get started with your own project.
this slide shows the evolution of the DMAC board. You can see on the left I started with a breadboard and DuPont connectors and I've evolved to soldered uh, headers with uh, wire wrapped connectors. Uh, you can also see there on the left that I'm using one of the transparent cases that uh, Chris Torrance has been advertising on his channel. Actually I'm joking. Uh, I have the case off so that it's easier to get to the slots. So what is DMA? Uh, in the Apple, uh, DMA is the ability for a peripheral to take control of the address and the data bus uh, without the assistance of the CPU uh, to read and write to memory and peripherals. Uh, in Waz's design in the Apple, um, there can only be one device accessing the address and data bus at a time. And so when the peripheral has control, the clock is actually stopped to the CPU. The diagram on the right is meant to show that when performing DMA, the peripheral is able to read and write on every clock cycle. So for instance, there are four clock cycles here, and the peripheral was able to read or write uh, four times. So what functions will be provided by the DMAC? Well, as stated earlier, uh, the goal was to provide in some way the capabilities uh, that the custom chips provide to the Amiga. Uh, so they provide graphics and sound capability. So to that end, uh, the DMAC board will provide uh, blitting functionality, which is quickly moving rectangular regions uh, of memory uh, to the screen. Um, it will also provide uh, rasterization of primitive types such as lines, triangles, and rectangles. Um, it will provide the functionality of the copper, uh, which is the ability to execute a program on a particular scan line uh, of the screen, uh, as well as general uh, memory management capability, uh, eventually moving memory between banks uh, of memory, depending on whether you have uh, a RAM factor or a RAMWorks uh, slinky style card. Um, and in case it wasn't clear in previous slides, uh, since the CPU is put to sleep during a DMA operation, uh, any uh, process that requires uh, a timing loop, uh, such as reading the joystick or um, your audio routines, they will no longer work because the uh, cycle timing uh, is no longer accurate because you can't detect when the processor has been put to sleep for a DMA cycle. Legacy chipsets, uh, such as on the Amiga, would provide quite a large register file for you to access the custom hardware. Uh, for instance, I think the Amiga has 60, 70 plus uh, registers that you need to access. Um, I decided to, to uh, implement this a different way on the DMAC board, uh, a slightly more modern way. So instead of uh, a bunch of individual registers for all of the functionality, I decided to go with uh, DMA command buffers. So you build a command buffer uh, in a similar way that you build uh, command buffers for the ProDOS MLI. You build a command buffer um, and you write uh, the address of that command buffer, buffer low byte, high byte, to F0, F1, and then C0, F2, you write the length. Uh, when you do that, that causes the card to DMA that data uh, into the card, and then uh, the processor uh, examines uh, that buffer and then causes further DMA to happen. So in this case uh, it's a line draw command uh, that is executed and written to the high-res screen. Due to time constraints uh, I'm only going to cover the copper and the blitter in this presentation. Uh, you can talk to me later on Discord uh, about the other elements. So let's get started with the copper. Um, so it's probably everyone uh, that's listening knows um, this is how a CRT screen is scanned. Uh, there's a raster that moves across the face and excites the phosphors um, and it moves from left to right uh, and top to bottom. Uh, at the end of each line uh, there is an H-sync pulse that causes the beam to return to the left uh, and at the bottom of the screen there's a V-sync pulse that causes the beam to return to the top. Uh, at the edges of the display uh, there's black areas called the blanking areas. Uh, on the Apple IIe, uh, those are black. Um, and on the GS, uh, 
uh, you're actually able to set the color of those areas, uh, but you can't on the 2E. Now instead of a raster position, think of it as memory locations uh, being retrieved by the scanner and sent to the shift register for display. So the card is able to detect uh, each cell uh, as the memory is read uh, and it can detect the H-Sync and V-Sync signals uh, as explained on the previous screen. So with that information, uh, let's say you wanted to implement uh, a mixed high-res, low-res, high-res screen as is shown here. So what would be necessary for that is you would need to wait for a particular raster position, uh, set uh, a soft switch, uh, wait for another raster position, and set uh, another soft switch. So as shown here, um, this is exactly what the copper does. So it has an instruction called wait. So you can wait for a particular raster position. And when that raster position is hit, uh, you're able to uh, read or write a particular soft switch. So in this case, uh, the top one is high res off. Um, we scan some low res for a while. And then when it hits B, uh, it is, uh, sets high res on again. So the lower part and the upper part of the screen are high res. Um, as you can probably imagine, uh, there's lots of other things you could do with this. You could control any peripheral card in the system uh, with this type of process. Uh, you could even do sound, although I have some other ideas for sound um, that we probably aren't going to get to in this presentation, but uh, we could talk about it in the Discord. The Amiga's Copper provided wait, move, and skip commands. Uh, the move command uh, would allow you to move data into a custom register uh, similar to what I have here as the soft switch command. So, uh, and I believe the skip command was rarely used. So for the time being, uh, I intend to implement uh, just wait and soft switch. Um, I have some ideas of some other uh, commands that could get really crazy here, but uh, for the time being, uh, it's just wait and soft switch. All right, let's move on to the blitter. So the Blitter is a fairly complicated device, so this will be a whirlwind tour. So on the Amiga and uh, in my design, uh, it allows three sources uh, and one destination. So you can see here on the left, uh, there's three input sources, and on the right, one output source. So that's essentially four DMA channels, three input, one output. Uh, each source can be independently enabled or disabled, so if you don't need three, uh, you can use uh, only one or two. Um, on the upper two, A and B, uh, you're allowed to do uh, various operations. Uh, you can mask uh, and shift. Um, and then the output is sent through uh, a combiner uh, that implements 256 different functions uh, to end up at the destination. So briefly, um, the masking uh, depending on how you're blitting and the area you're blitting from memory, uh, you might require uh, a mask uh, if you're not byte aligned uh, on your source. So you might require a mask uh, for the first and last bytes. Um, and I've also added a mid-byte mask as well. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. The A and the B channel also allow you to perform shifts so that you can align the data to a particular bit boundary. And the shifter is also aware of the fact that the high bit is not part of the data and should not be shifted. With 256 different ways to combine the three sources, as one Amiga video I was watching put it, uh, that is a confusingly huge number of possibilities. Uh, I'm not really sure how many of these uh, are actually useful, um, but typically uh, at least on the Amiga, you could get by uh, with a small handful. Some of those are shown here on the right. Uh, copy operation is pretty simple. Uh, XOR is a read, modify, write. So in that case, you would set up the C source to actually point to the destination also. Um, and if you're not familiar with Boolean logic, uh, the not A and C or A and not C uh, is the same as XOR. Um, if you want to do transparency, uh, on the Amiga, you would use the cookie cut function, and you can see kind of how that works here. So you would have uh, on the A channel uh, a bit mask that has ones everywhere that you want to be opaque, uh, and zeros everywhere that you want to be transparent. On the B channel, you'd have your graphic 
uh, and on the C channel again you'd have your destination uh, and so when those are combined uh, using the min term A and B or not A and C uh, you would end up with the sumo wrestler uh, over the background. Unlike on the Amiga where memory is linear the number of bits per pixel is specified by the number of bit planes and the screen starting position is specified in a custom register. On the Apple those things aren't true. So the DMAC will need to know also uh, what screen mode the system is in uh, which will specify uh, the base starting address um, as well as whether you're in one of the double modes 80 column or double high res uh, where the memory is interleaved. Additionally, it will need to know if you want to address high res or double high res in monochrome mode uh, instead of color mode. And finally, a word on caching. So, as mentioned earlier, the DMAC card will allow you to cache your graphics on board uh, for quicker access through the DMA engine. Uh, in addition, uh, it will provide a write-through cache for screen memory. So any writes uh, will get written to both the internal RAM uh, as well as DMA'd out to system RAM, but reads will both come from the internal sprite and graphics cache uh, and the internal copy of the screen memory. Uh, so in order for this to work correctly, um, of course, there can't be any other devices DMAing into uh, graphics memory, um, and you can't write to memory yourself with the processor. So what is actually working on the board right now? Well, I do have DMA read and write working. Uh, I have a pretty lame demo on the right-hand side over here, which is showing uh, a simple fill operation based on the number of bytes you've written to C0, F0. Um, I do have copper comparisons uh, working, but uh, not well enough uh, to put any kind of a demo together. Um, and as far as the graphics work that I've been doing, uh, I've been doing most of that in um, what I'm calling a Apple IIe screen simulator. So this is basically the guts of the MAME uh, video driver for the Apple II uh, that I wrapped uh, with some command line tools that allows me to test all of my algorithms here before I would put them on the card. So I have many of the graphics functions uh, working as you see here. Uh, there's a double high res uh, set of triangles. Uh, in the lower right there is a uh, line rendering. Uh, the upper and lower part of that has the palette bit set and not set. Um, and then there's uh, some rendering of Mario uh, on offset uh, pixels. So that's actually all that's working uh, at the moment. Uh, I apologize that I wasn't able to put a cool demo together, uh, but maybe uh, next Kansas Fest uh, I will have everything working, um, and I look forward to talking to everyone in the Discord. Oh. Okay. Oh. Sorry, right, um, so actually, uh, as it turns out, uh, before we get started with the questions, uh, I was able to put together uh, a kind of lame uh, demo. So I'm going to go ahead and show that uh, right now. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, great. Uh, all right, so this is, a, this is a, just a brief demo of the copper. So what's going on here? is uh, on graphics page one, uh, I have loaded this image, the, the Kansas Fest image with the Apple II Forever logo. Uh, and on page two, uh, I have this uh, Morrison is cool um, screen. That's kind of a, uh, an inside joke uh, from my work. Um, but uh, anyway, so on uh, each of these alternating lines, what's happening is uh, the DMAC card is stealing a cycle here. Uh, and switching to page two, and it's, and it's um, stealing a cycle here and switching back to page one. And then of course that's scrolling along the screen. So then also to show that this uh, is not taking uh, much, uh, well, it's hardly taking any CPU time uh, at all. 
uh, I go on to write a basic program here. So actually first I do a catalog. So I wanna um, say a quick word about that. So as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, if you, um, okay, let me back up. I have a deep, or I have a booty card in this machine. Uh, I'm not using a floppy drive. Uh, if I was using a floppy drive, this would certainly not work because the floppy drive uses timing loops uh, in order to read from the drive. Apparently the booty card does it, uh, which is great. Either that or I've got lucky every time I've typed catalog while I'm running this demo. Anyway, so I go on here. Uh, I write a quick program. This was captured off my system, by the way. So there we go. Kansas Fest is cool. Um, also, uh, let me go here. So I anticipated a few questions. Several people have asked, uh, does it work with the GS? Um, the short answer is probably. Uh, I believe the timing that I have for the DMA uh, will work. Um, there's no support in my graphics library yet for any GS stuff. Uh, does it work with a PAL Apple? I don't know. I don't know what the differences are between PAL and the NTSC Apple. Does it work with anybody's accelerator? Again, I don't know. I understand that there's problems uh, with some accelerator chips based on uh, the fact that they don't handle the DMA line uh, or they don't or they don't handle the ready line, possibly. Uh, does it work with the cool vidHD card? Again, I don't know. I don't have one. Uh, I don't if if he uh, understands the DMA line, if he, uh, uses his, or if he flushes a cache when you write to memory, um, it probably will work. Um, but again, I don't know. I don't have one. And I don't know about these other cards. Um, I don't handle all the DMA signals uh, appropriately at the moment, so it doesn't work with any other uh, DMA cards at the moment, but uh, that support is uh, coming. All right. Uh, Hey. Ops. So, a uh, question: Can it can it time so you don't have the option skip or no? Don't skip the color burst to have some lines black and white on old TV monitors. I'm just trying to read from the chat here. Uh, no, um, I don't have the capability of doing that. I would actually have to change the scanner uh, for that. So this doesn't add any. This doesn't add any functionality to that part of the system. So all the graphics modes work as they did. Uh, you know, the palette bit is still a problem. Color fringing is still a problem. Uh, this just allows you to write to memory uh, quickly and give these other capabilities. What is a booty card? Uh, uh, Chris Torrance sells those on his site. Um, it's a hard drive emulator card. Let me see. Oh, here. there you go. Somebody posted that. Yep. I wanted to have a lot more cool demos, uh, but as I mentioned, um, didn't happen. Uh, I'm progressing, uh, but uh, uh, I need more time. Okay, we have a couple. Uh, can DMA be paused if IRQ NMI is active so music mouse drivers can still have low latency? Sure, you could pause DMA. Um, yes and no. Uh, you would probably have to tell the card to stop doing DMA while you wanted to perform your interrupted routines. And can the copper be upgraded to the 3DO style copper where it allows scaling and rotation of an arbitrary image for super high res? That would be really cool. Uh, that's not on uh, my plan at the moment. Uh, but you know what? As I mentioned at the beginning, all this stuff is going to be open source. Uh, all the files, uh, PSOC Creator, uh, all my libraries uh, will be available. Uh, so, you know, if you don't like my initial implementation, you're welcome to go in uh, and make modifications uh, and add all the cool new features. Okay. Uh, what is the max bandwidth the bidder can operate? So you can only write at the maximum rate uh, at the bus speed of the system. So on the Apple, it's you know slightly over one megahertz. Um, on the Amiga, 
okay, it's it's one megahertz and it's a byte at a time. Uh, on the Amiga, uh, you know, the bus speed was seven point something, I forget exactly, maybe 7.14 megahertz. Um, and it wrote uh, a word at a time or two bytes. So it could move, what, 14 times more, 14 times faster than what we can uh, on the Apple. Uh, but again, the maximum rate is, uh, is one megahertz, basically. Okay. Uh, getting a lot of love for your, for your game room there. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, so when bidder operates, is the 6502 is set on hold? Yes. During any DMA cycle, the clock is stopped to the CPU. And you might say, well, then you can't use your CPU for other things, but you also have to think about the fact that you were going to draw graphics anyway. Uh, it was going to take you some number of CPU cycles. It will now just take you less uh, and the processor clock will be stopped during that time. Oh, there's some people typing. Let's see if anything else pops up here. Uh, video streaming. Yeah. Uh, it's a possibility. You know, this chip is super flexible. Um, you could probably add uh, an Ethernet controller to it. You can definitely, I mean, it's got built-in serial um, the debugging, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, if you connect a USB cable, uh, you know, the, the programming cable, the top part of that chip, um, there's also a USB serial, so you can do serial debugging. So on the, on the board, you can hit enter, for instance, on your uh, PC, uh, and type commands into the card. You can send text back and whatnot. Um, that didn't answer your question about streaming. Um, Anyway, that was, I was trying to get at the fact that you could get data into it. You could probably find another way to get data into it quickly. Um, it's possible that it could accelerate uh, video as well. Uh, next question. Do you allow for the limited hold of DMA on the CPU? Do I allow for the limited hold? Do you mean... I wonder if they mean the maximum number of cycles. Oh, uh, hang on. I think they're updating their question. If what is meant is uh, there's a maximum number of cycles that you can hold off the CPU before it forgets its registers, uh, the answer is yes, that will be implemented soon. Uh, I don't have it implemented at the moment. Um, I'm only doing very short DMA cycles. And actually, I've tried long 256-byte cycles many times and haven't had any problem with my system but that doesn't mean it's not really a problem. Um, and uh, there's an interesting story by Waz in Sather's book uh, about that, where he basically said, well, when the chip is brand new, I could do DMA forever. And, you know, as it got older, uh, it would reduce to some fewer cycles. So that's probably what's happening. I have a pretty new 65CO2 in my, in my system. Yep, the, the, that was exactly what the person was asking. Okay. Uh, does DMA hold cause the NTSC video timing to become desynced? No. Uh, the, the video scanner uh, and the, the, the processor are kind of two different parts inside of the Apple. Uh, so uh, you can, I mean, that's why, for instance, you could find an old motherboard uh, and you turn it on and you get video but nothing else works. It's because the scanner part is still working and the processor or RAM or whatever is bad. Uh, so those two are disconnected. Um, you, could, you could pull the CPU, I think, mm -hmm. and still get video uh, on the Apple, but, but pausing DMA doesn't affect the, the signaling. Uh, somebody wants to know what the middle pinball table is. <laughs> the middle pinball, that's uh, the Rolling Stones. I have, uh, let's see here, Metallica, Rolling Stones, and Revenge from Mars. And over here, off screen, I have uh, Iron Maiden. I don't actually have either one of these two, but I have a friend that works at Stern that got me the posters. <laughs> Anything else? Right. Uh, 
that looks like it might be it. Yep. Audio? Oh, question here. Audio? Audio. Yes. Uh, so I have thoughts on audio, uh, but there's nothing implemented at the moment. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, in the description, uh, it'll probably be PWM audio. Um, and likely the way I'll do that is, you know, for instance, uh, when scanning the screen, there's 65 uh, cycles horizontally. And so I'll probably take uh, there's 65, 65 cycles per uh, horizontal sync. So uh, probably what I'll do is uh, every horizontal sync, uh, I'll hit C030 and then um, uh, take an individual sample from there. Um, uh, with 65 cycles, I could have uh, what, six bits of um, analog data and then modulate the um, the um, PWM uh, based on the value uh, of that data. So uh, every horizontal sync hit C0 and then modify one more time hitting C030 along there based on the data. Uh, that'll put it at 15.7 kHz for the uh, carrier frequency. I don't know, that, will, that may or may not be audible. Uh, probably won't be audible to me, uh, but it might be audible to the younger crowd. Uh, GitHub address, please. Uh, don't have it yet, but I will okay. let everybody know. Uh, uh, anybody else? SID emulation. So that's actually oh. a reasonable question. Um, so once the, the PWM audio is working, uh, then the question is, okay, do I add MIDI capability, do I just use straight, uh, you know, samples? Um, I guess I haven't decided yet. Uh, do I add multiple oscillators that, that have different waveforms, uh, square wave, triangle wave, whatnot? Haven't decided. Okay, um, so I think we're just about to the time. Uh, I feel like there's going to be a lot more questions about this. Uh, so I've been pulling out of the chat and the Discord because this seems to be a big, big thing. So uh, anybody who we didn't get to, please uh, hop on over to the Discord and you can continue the conversation. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Great. Thanks.